What's good, fam? Teacher Eddie back with another reaction. Today we're doing one of my favorite subjects, which is baseball history. So we're talking about the 1919 World Series, the Chicago White Sox versus the Cincinnati Reds in a best out of nine series. That's right. They were trying to melt this baseball thing as much as they could. So they decided, hey, man, instead of best of seven, let's do best of nine. The Chicago White Sox were heavily favored. Uh, they were a hundred game winning team. They had a cast of who's who including one of the greatest players of all time mr shoeless joe jackson himself third highest batting average for a career in major league baseball history but unfortunately this was during an era uh where there were no multi-million dollar contracts there was no such thing as free agency baseball players were basically indentured servants and the uh, white Sox in this case were under the rule of one Charles Comiskey, Charlie Comiskey, known as the old Roman. Uh, he was a piece of shit. And we're going to get into why these players decided they were going to throw the 1919 World Series and basically ruin baseball uh, and almost bring it to the brink of death until a man named Babe Ruth comes along and single handedly saves baseball. So, drunk history. This is going to be my first time reacting to drunk history. I've done some drunk history myself. So let's get into it. Hello, I'm Katie Nolan. And this is the story of the Blackhawks. Blackhawks? <laughs> Blackhawks? You want to do Blackhawk down? Maybe. I feel like Maybe. we should do. Okay. Should we do the baseball thing instead? And then yeah. you can yeah. do the yeah. we'll do yeah. Blackhawk down. God okay. bless Josh Hartnett, though. Hello. Yeah, what the fuck happened to Josh Hartnett, man? He was hot for a minute there. Then he did that fucking Pearl Harbor movie and that movie where he wasn't supposed to have sex for 30 days or whatever. Was that him? I don't know. I'm Katie Nolan. Hey, Katie. And this is the Black Sox scandal. Oh my God, she's so cute. Our story begins in 1919, exactly 100 years ago. 102 Chicago now. The White Sox are in the middle of a winning season. Their owner, Charles Comiskey, was a piece of shit. He's there you go, one. man. I did said it just a minute ago. Charles Kaminsky, a piece of shit. Absolutely. Bunch of money. He doesn't even pay for their laundering of their uniforms. The player. Yes. So this is a very interesting uh, tidbit here. So a lot of people think that the uh, Chicago White Sox uh, started becoming called the Black Sox uh, because of, you know, the negative connotation for throwing the World Series. They stained the game of baseball. They're not White Sox. They're the Black Sox. They were actually called the Black Sox before the 1919 World Series for this specific reason. Now, Charlie Comiskey was one of the most brilliant businessmen of his time. This motherfucker, I mean, every, every nickel that was made in his stadium, Comiskey Park, he played a role in. He even bottled his own soda in the basement. I mean, he was involved in everything, and, and, and man, he can rub a nickel together like nobody else. So one of the things was he would not pay for players to uh, launder their uniforms. So the players were like, you ain't paying us shit anyway. This was by far one of the greatest teams of its era, but it was one of the most underpaid teams that there was in baseball. So they said, fuck it, man, we, we just aren't going to wash our uniforms. And they became so dirty that writers started calling them the Black Sox. So they were called the Black Sox before all that. Then Comiskey said, fine, I'll pay for the laundry of your uniforms. But then he took it out of their World Series bonuses. Uh, also, um, the best pitcher on the team uh, was Eddie Sicat or Sicati. Uh, it's pronounced many different ways by many people. But Eddie Sicat, uh was promised a $10,000 bonus by Comiskey if he won 30 games and he got to 29 games won, and then comiskey forced uh the manager kid gleason to bench eddie seacott so he wouldn't have to pay him that ten thousand dollars this is the type of owner we're talking about because again this is 50 years before you have things like free agency right players were just tied to a team if he became injured 
hey, fuck off. There's no pension. There's no nothing. They're paid shit. They can't ask to be traded to another team. Only the team owner can decide if they want to sell their player to another team. So players, again, are basically indentured servitude. You know, they're getting paid something, but they're really not getting paid much. I mean, fucking Mickey Mantle had to sell used cars in the offseason. Babe Ruth did plays and movies and things of that nature. So this is just setting the scene for what type of owner this is. Players are like, this is bullshit. We're playing good baseball. They're playing great pay baseball. we more money because we're people and we have families. So the, the players are being f***ed by ownership. They were pissed. So yes. Chick Gandal, first baseman, he's like, look, I'm towards the end of my career. I want to make a bunch of money. And I can't make a bunch of money because I'm not getting paid it. So Arnold Ross I feel that, man. That That's pretty much, that sums up my entire life. And I can't make a bunch of money because I'm not getting paid it. I can't make a bunch of money because I'm not being paid it, man. Uh, so Chick Gandal. Chick Gandal uh, was a former hobo, uh, was a former uh, brawler. He would fight in, you know, uh, bars and things of that nature for money. Uh, he was a decent, okay first baseman. Nothing really special about him. But the other thing about the Black Sox is there was no team camaraderie. These people hated each other with a passion. Uh, for example, the highest played uh, player on the team was Eddie Collins. Eddie Collins was the second baseman. So when they were practicing, they would purposefully just never throw to Collins, right? So he could not get any practice in with his teammates. They would bump into each other on purpose when they were walking off the field. Uh, Chick Gandal didn't even talk to, hadn't talked to Eddie Collins since like 1915. He hadn't talked to him for four years. So I forget which member, I think it was Eddie Cicada actually. Like, I didn't know what it was like to be on a you know the definition of teamwork until i played for the white Sox because there was just no team there whatsoever so you also have to understand the, these were not happy people there was no team camaraderie here there was nothing i mean this is building the stage right they're underpaid they're undervalued they got a shit bag for an owner uh, you know, people like, uh, um, uh, Gandal are reaching the end of their career and they got nothing, right? They hate each other. There's no, hey team, let's win the world series. They couldn't fucking care less. So Arnold Rothstein, who was a mob dude. Mob dude. Arnold Rothstein approaches him and he says, hey kid, I want to make money. You want to make money. What? You play games for a living. I will pay you monies and you will throw the World Series. And he's like, that's it? That's so easy, I can lose. <laughs> and so Rothstein said, look, I'm glad you're on the team, but one person is not enough to throw a baseball game. We're gonna need a lot of other people, maybe like eight people. So he called a meeting with a bunch of players on the team. Yeah, so um, that's not exactly how it went down. So uh, just a little backstory. Uh, fixing baseball games was really nothing new at this time. It was kind of like Watergate, right? Uh, when the news came out that Nixon was recording conversations in the White House, he was not the first president. Eisenhower was actually the first president to do that um, because he brought it over from Germany. I believe maybe Truman even, as early as Truman, but definitely Eisenhower because he noticed uh, the Nazis uh, were recording everything. Kennedy recorded his conversations, Johnson recorded them, Nixon recorded them. It's just Nixon was the first one who got caught, right? So there were plenty of players who made basically a bigger career in fixing games than they actually made playing baseball. So this was nothing new. And Gandal actually let it be known to pretty much anybody who would listen that is like, hey guys, I'm willing to throw the World Series for money. Right? It wasn't a huge secret. So it wasn't Rothstein who approached him first. It was actually Gandal who let it be known. Rothstein, um, I don't believe Rothstein ever actually met any other players. He used goad betweens. One of them was a former featherweight champion uh, who was basically muscle for Rothstein uh, named A. Battelle. A. Battelle is actually arguably one of the greatest featherweights, if not the greatest featherweight champion of all time. His career was, of course, afterwards and reputation were tarnished. Uh, and then a former player named Sleepy Bill Burns, right? 
So those were the go-betweens. So again, it's not like they were a pro. They let it be known. And Seacott said, I could probably get six players, right? Uh, but then he got a seventh player because he didn't think Eddie Seacott uh, would come over, right? The eighth player found out about the conspiracy and basically said, if you don't let me in, I'm going to go and tell the boss, right? I'm going to tell Comiskey. So the eighth guy wasn't really necessary because he wasn't really a role player on the team, but that's how the eighth guy gets in on it. Now that included Eddie Seacott, Lefty Williams, and then Shoeless Joe Jackson. Yeah. And so Chick Candle, he's like, look everybody, I met this dude, he will give us $100,000 if we lose the World Series. And a lot of them were like, oh, what? I love baseball. All I've ever done is devoted my life to baseball. And Chick's like, yeah, no, I get it. But we can make more money losing than we will earn notoriety. This is so wonderful. So the guy's like, I will compromise everything for some cash. So the players leave that meeting and they recruited a bunch of dudes within the team. So they have eight people. I want to bring the mic down to my face. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> we get to the point where they get to the World Series. The Chicago White Sox versus Cincinnati Reds. Game one, best of nine. The White Sox heavily, heavily. favored, and Eddie Seacott takes the mound. So the signal between the yes. players and the gambling guy was that Eddie would hit the very first batter. And he did. He winds up, he throws his first pitch, and it's a perfect strike. He throws it right down the middle. And everyone's like, wait, what the f-? I thought we were going to throw the game. Second pitch, winds up, throws it, thunk, hits, hits him the in the back. back. And so everybody knows. Yeah, he hit him in the back, yeah. Yes, so. so the game goes on and on and on. Eddie throws terrible pitches. Terrible, yeah. They lose nine to one. Yep. Holy shit. The papers come out the next day, Derek. <laughs> and they're like, what? But we got to go on to game two. Throughout the series, they keep losing. Yeah. So what happens is there are rumors already before the World Series even starts that the fix is in Uh, because all of a sudden the, the, the Sox who were heavily favored. Now, Arnold Rothstein was not a mob dude. Uh, He was a gambler. He had mob affiliations, but he wasn't actually a gangster. Now, he wasn't actually a gambler either because Rothstein never bet on anything that he either didn't have control over, he didn't have some insider info, or he didn't fix himself, right? The old saying at the time, the only thing that Arnold Rothstein won't bet on is the weather, because he can't fix the weather, right? So he wasn't really, he didn't give a shit about sports either. All he cared about was making money, right? So Rothstein had mob affiliations, but he wasn't a gangster himself. Now, uh, in game one, uh, Seacott pitches a terrible game. Uh, Lefty Williams, terrible game in game two. So Seacott loses t- both of his games. Uh, Lefty Williams loses both of uh, his games. The one game that they do win uh, is uh, pitched by Dickie Kerr. Dickie Kerr was not in on the fix. He had no clue or anything about it. So the 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 fielders were trying to lose the game as as much as they could. Now, a lot of people point to the fact, especially those who have seen the movie Eight Men Out, that, wait, uh, Shoeless Joe Jackson uh, hit for like 375 in the series. He hit the only home run that the White Sox had, even though that was a game that they lost and it was a blowout. Um, and he didn't make any errors. That is absolute nonsense. He made a lot of errors. So the statistics show that Jackson had an amazing series, but you could have great statistics, But there's other ways you could fuck the game up, right? The games that he really batted well in were games that they were getting blown out in anyway. But in the field, he was awful. He would slow down so he wouldn't catch up to uh, balls. He would constantly, he would be dropping balls. The infielders uh, would constantly, for example, um, uh, the shortstop, I forget his name. Uh, I think it was Hap Felsch. Uh, like, uh, the easy double play, but he doesn't even step on second base before he throws the ball and then Gandal drops it. So mostly it was fielding errors that lost him the game, 
right so even though like buck weaver later on said i only attended the meetings i had a great series i hit like 325 yeah but it was the fielding errors that was really what sold it you know whoopsies i should have probably caught that and then they were like oh i wish i could throw that to the plate <laughs> but i can only throw it yeah they the would pitch. forcibly cut the ball oh, off when oh, it wasn't I necessary uh, whoopsies and Chick Randall was like, oh, I'm going to get this. I got it. I got it. I got it. And he waved everybody off. And then and he said he just didn't got it. <laughs> I'm Pretty getting much. too drunk to be able to You're maintain. Okay. We're just going to finish Yeah, okay. You're good. So the series is four to one. Lefty yes. Williams says, hey, we have not received any payments. We're not going to keep throwing our legacy for nothing. Yeah. Let's go up it on the baseball field. Let's come from behind and win this World Series. Yay! So for the next few games, they're like trying. They're winning. Then the night before the eighth game. Yeah. So because she, she skipped over a big part here. So at this point, uh, who got paid, who didn't get paid? I believe, I may be mistaken, but I believe Lefty Williams is the only one who got any significant amount of money uh or maybe no actually it was seacott it was seacott she's right it was lefty williams who said fuck guys what's going on man this is bullshit so uh seacott was promised twenty thousand dollars and he received ten uh shoeless joe jackson received five and i don't know uh what the other players received but i know there were a few players uh like buck weaver didn't get a penny uh i don't think lefty williams got any money either I don't know about the other guys, but basically at this point, uh, Rothstein and his cohorts are like, man, we got you by the balls. What are you going to do? Go and run and complain to somebody? What, that you didn't get paid for throwing the World Series? Like, fuck you, man. We ain't going to pay you. So the next two games, they do win. So now the series is four to three. And uh, the eighth game, uh, Lefty Williams is going to pitch. And now, of course, Frostine and his cohorts are getting a little nervous because now it's 4-3. So there's a possibility the Sox are going to win. So this is what happens next. In the series, Arnold Rothstein and his associates visited Lefty Williams in his hotel room. Rothstein says, if by the first inning it isn't obvious we're going to lose, I will murder your wife. Yes. And Lefty Williams was like, I'm shook. I'm shook. So game eight, <laughs> Lefty goes out. He's the starting pitcher and he sucks sucks real bad like on purpose bad and they end up losing 10 to yeah he gives up lefty williams gives up four runs in the first inning uh and he doesn't even make it out of the first inning uh kid gleason the manager replaces him uh before the first inning is even over right and this is the game that um uh shoeless joe hits his home run as well but again you know pointless to five and that's it the world series is over and cincinnati has won people were shocked, shocked. and then there started to be these rumors people are like uh it felt fixed and the press that's what i'm talking about labels the white socks the black socks why it's black mark it's bad the black market's Forever. bad yeah the black dude is like man what the fuck man why does it got to be black male black bald black socks man that ain't right man it ain't uh but yeah so the rumors actually start like i said beforehand because a lot of the money that's now coming in on the games before game one even starts are so is starting to go on the reds and people are like what the fuck why are people betting on cincinnati that's like betting against prime mike tyson right there was no doubt that the white Sox were going to win they were so far superior uh so the money starts pouring in and there's already rumors going around before game one even starts so i forget the uh the the uh press writer uh because back in the day they would have all the press writers in a box they'd be typing away their stories as they're watching the game so one of the like top press writers of the time sports writers invites the great christy matthewson so christy matthewson is arguably i mean one of the greatest pitchers of all time one of the most beloved players at the time as well they used to call him the christian gentleman he served in world war one 
alongside Ty Cobb in the same unit. By the time they get to France, the fighting's already over. But unfortunately, during a training exercise in 19, it was 1917 um, or 1918, uh, Christy Mathewson is exposed to poison gas, which permanently damages his lungs. So, of course, his baseball career is over at this point. He only lives for like another five years uh, after that. So he's invited as like the most trustworthy person you have in baseball to sit in in the box and to observe the game to make sure there are no shenanigans. And Christy Mathewson from game one listed out like hundreds of things that happened during the series. He was like, this is, this is just so obvious. They really weren't trying to hide it. It was just so fucking ridiculous as to how bad they were playing. Now, a lot of people didn't want to believe it, right? So it wasn't immediately after the World Series was over. Uh, actually, they all returned for the 1920 season, and well into the 1920 season, uh, they're contending again for the pennant. So at this time, there are no playoffs. So whoever has the best record in the American League and National League goes straight to the World Series, right? So the Sox are on their way to clinching another pennant. Uh, and during the summer is when the rumors really start. It was one sports writer who wrote the story and kind of broke the seal because everybody was like, man, we don't want to ruin the game of baseball. Let's just ignore it. Right. But one writer was like, nah, man, fuck that shit. So he writes the story and then people start picking it up. And then Christy Mathewson comes in with everything else. So now an investigation is opened. Uh, but the investigation really doesn't start till like October of 1920, which I'm sure she'll probably get into right now. So, there's a grand jury investigation. This is going to be ridiculous. Eddie Sita and Shulis Joe both break down in front of the grand jury. Yes. They said, yep, I did it. Yeah. I have a family. I didn't make enough money. Is your hand okay when you did that? <laughs> Ow, don't do that. Hey, 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 hey. Shulis Joe I love was it. like, I am shoeless Joe Jackson, and I'm not wearing any shoes. <laughs> Why did he have the name shoeless Joe Jackson? Because there was a legend that when he was playing in the minor leagues, uh, he had brand new shoes and they were way too tight. So he took them off and just played in his socks. And ever since then, he was known as shoeless Joe Jackson. Uh, but shoeless Joe was uh, illiterate. Um, he couldn't read. He couldn't write. Uh, not the brightest bulb at the time, but the man could hit. But then again, most baseball players, a lot of baseball players at this time were, uh, you know, farmers. Like I said, Chick Gandel was a hobo before becoming a baseball player. So, you know, as long as you could play, it didn't really matter. There weren't really farm systems at this time or anything like that. Not really until Branch Rickey comes in and starts creating the farm system uh, to, you know, to, to, to grow your own players, so to speak. This is what led to the very first commissioner of baseball. Yes. He had the most first name ever, Kennesaw Mountain Landis. Yes. He comes out and he's like, we won't stand for no cheaters. And so all those eight men involved in the Black Sox scandal banned from baseball for life. And so now there's no more cheaters left. In yeah. So she skipped over some very important parts. So. Uh, there's the grand jury, uh, jury, right? So the grand jury impanels the players, and also they bring in uh, A. Battelle, uh, they bring in uh, Sleepy Bill Burns. I don't think they bring in Rothstein because they just didn't have enough evidence on Rothstein because, again, he didn't actually meet with the players. He used middlemen, right? The man was smart. So uh, Seacod and Jackson break down, and they admit to everything, right? The other players don't say shit, right? But these two... They fully confessed to everything. So then the, the case goes to trial. But mysteriously, their confessions disappear, right? And they change their tune. And they also get a great lawyer, which all of a sudden appears out of nowhere. Obviously, probably paid for by Rothstein. And so they are acquitted at trial and they celebrate. Meanwhile, uh, Ben Johnson, uh, who is the leader of the National League, I believe, uh, he hated Comiskey. So he kept on digging, digging, digging. So all the teams are nervous now because attendance is way down in baseball. 
So they get rid of the National Committee, which was a committee of several uh, people who decided, you know, the rules of baseball, this, that, and the other thing, but they didn't have a lot of power. So they decide to name just one person who has total control over everything baseball, whatever their decision is, cannot be overturned, cannot be questioned, and the appointment is for life, so they can never be fired, right? That was actually demanded by by judge Kennesaw Mountain Landis. So Kennesaw Mountain Landis was a federal judge, big baseball fan, always at games, very, very clout chaser type guy. He would, he would give out these insane sentences. Uh, one time he sentenced a 72 year old man to 15 years in prison for like a minor theft. And the man was like, I'm 72 years old. I can't do 15 years. And he's like, do your best. So a lot of uh, Landis's decisions uh, get overturned, but he doesn't care because they make great, uh, great, you know, headlines in the press. So when they do come to him, because he's just seen as this, and he just looked the part too, if you look at pictures of him, and he demands that it be a lifetime appointment, right? Uh, he demands a, you know, a high salary, complete and absolute power, but at the same time, he never really abused it. Uh, he went against what most owners thought he was going to do, and he actually gave a shit about baseball, and he really cleaned up baseball. So the day after they are acquitted, and they think they're going to go back and play, uh, the very next day, Kennesaw Mountain Landis announces that all eight men who were accused are banned for life from baseball. Uh, so, again, uh, most of them said, look, especially Joe Jackson was like, if I knew... Uh, I never would have done it, of course. In Major League Baseball, except all the cheaters that existed after that. Exactly. I have no shoes on. Do you get it? I love you. It's I am so in love. I am so in love with you right now. Oh my god, that was so fantastical. So yeah, so um, the players are then banned for life. Uh, what happens is... Um, you know, a lot of people come out defending, of course, mostly Shoeless Joe Jackson. Uh, there's the famous, say it ain't so, Joe. Uh, that actually didn't really happen like that. Uh, it, Joe Jackson was leaving court one day, and uh, yeah, a kid uh, just started saying, it ain't true, Joe, it ain't true. And uh, a lot of people started chanting the same thing, it ain't true, it ain't true. Uh, Joe didn't say a word, he just walked away, and that was it. So no kid ever said, say it ain't so, Joe. Um, so they're never allowed to play baseball again. A lot of people come out to defend Joe Jackson using his statistics again. But it was clearly obvious that his fielding was in question. Uh, Buck Weaver's another one. He said he just sat in on the meetings. So Kennesaw Mountain Landis, as commissioner, said, not only are you banned if you... Uh, throw games, but even if you sit in on a meeting where it's being discussed and you don't notify anybody, you're getting banned as well. There he is right behind me. Kennesaw Mountain Landis right in the middle there. Um, so uh, Joe Jackson uh, unfortunately goes on to have a miserable existence. Uh, he lives for another 30 years or so. Uh, he ends up playing in a lot of um, just barnstorming teams and uh then he eventually runs a liquor store and there's a very sad story one day ty cobb uh stops by the liquor store and notices joe working the counter uh but joe isn't saying anything to him and after a while uh ty cobb says joe uh don't you recognize me and he's like of course i recognize you ty but i just figured you guys you know wouldn't want to recognize me so it, it, was, it was a very tragic tale and of course, you know, a lot of people, well, you threw the World Series. There's Joe Jackson right behind me right now. Um, but at the same time, like I said, these, these were ignorant farm boys who were being mistreated by their owner, who were looking, uh, there's Buck Weaver, who were looking to make some money and they were being underpaid. They were being abused by their owner. Uh, he didn't pay them the bonuses that they were promised. And these were people with families who weren't making that much money anyway. So somebody comes and says, Hey man, I'll give you $20,000 in 1919. How are you going to turn that down? Right. 
But either case, I hope you enjoyed this video. I had a lot of fun doing this one because, again, uh, baseball history is one of my favorite things to discuss. Let me know in the comments section uh, any type of history videos you'd like me to do. They don't have to be, like, history history. It could be sports-related history. It could be movie-related history. It could be music-related history. Just whatever history you're interested in that your history teachers don't teach you, but you wish they did, uh, because I love doing this stuff. But in either case, I've been Teacher Eddie, and I'll catch you next time. Bam! And as always, shining out the Patreons who keep things running here, starting with the Chancellors, Elena G, Nazvanyu, Douglas C, KP, The Hollow King, The Principals, Aaron Shepard, Addison, Clement, Vijandra, Rachel, Alex, King Panda, Freeman, Moody Kakati, Nathan, Chad, Chris Tobago, Sophia, Robin, Lord Gandalf, Luna, Harry, Robin, and Blue Tech. And of course, Rasmus. I've been Teacher Eddie, and I'll catch you next time.